the child is, goes to the teacher who will guide that child. mean by external moral authority? You use that expression a lot. Materialism has to do with when you are... Hello, it's great to have all of you back for the next episode of this course in Values and Spirituality. We are currently on page 19 of book number two. And in this episode, we will be looking at a number of aspects, which I will tell you about as we go along. The first aspect that we are taking up is the requirements for developing spirituality and values. What I noted about this segment is that um, Sister Denise, the author of these books, has set this course out step by step so that the adult student can know exactly where to go at every juncture. So nothing has been left to chance and actually nothing has been left out. Every aspect and every um, milestone of spiritual development has been included in this course. So Sister Denise, I welcome you. Thank you. Okay, you start off by saying an ideal educational program must not only prepare us intellectually but also underlie our social and professional competency and participation in the world. Uh, I'd like to know why you focused on these two particular competencies. You see, sometimes people think of themselves and each other in very sort of categorized uh, separate sections. This course is holistic. That means you look at a particular area of a person's consciousness or their activities, behavior or whatever, but as soon as you do that, you put it in the context of the whole. Uh, we need to have the intellectual component because we need to be able to articulate our values we need to know why we hold those values and we have to have figured it out. We have to be able to, if anybody says to you, I don't agree with your values, your values are stupid, etc., etc., you need to be able to come back and articulate very clear why they're not stupid and why you hold them, which in turn is going to force the other person to have to articulate why they hold theirs and there's nothing to say you have to have the same values. But the issue is, if you do have different values, then you have to be able to work out some compromise. You have to negotiate how you're going to function together when you have different value systems. And this is where the social component comes in. Because as I said earlier, we don't exist in isolation and our values are um, operating in the social environment and therefore we need to be able to function well intellectually and socially in order to live in harmony. Uh, could you tell us what you mean by the following words? Consequently, moral and ethical components are implied throughout the program and contextualized in the challenges of daily life. While studying the practical application of spirituality and values, you will see clearly how they work in everyday life and experience the values directly. We talk about this because sometimes a person who is studying this sort of thing, moral philosophy, spirituality and so on, you take it to another realm which is outside of daily life and it becomes intellectualized. But um, there is another kind of compartmentalization there. And part of the holistic approach to life, values, spirituality is how is this lived? Because if you aren't living it, we can say it's not real. And you can say, well, I believe this and that and the other. And then you behave in a way that doesn't fit with that. And then you say, well, that's nothing to do with it because how I live and what I think uh, doesn't have to work together. But what we're saying is, of course, it has to work together. You cannot separate those. I really liked what is contained in paragraph three. It says at the beginning of it, 
the best conditions for success occur when principles are demonstrated and at the end you say such integrity means that you deal with others with tact and respect your attitude reflects your principles um, it becomes very obvious that that which is contained in this books is not theory it's practical it has to be practical you know one of the big problems that we had to contend with when we were uh, setting about writing this is to figure out something that works because everything that had gone before didn't work and mm. there's no point in writing a book that doesn't work when we already have plenty of books that al already don't work mm. and this is why there's a lot of attention on the practical side is this doable mm. you know there are many high ideas that are beautifully articulated and people will say, yes, this is excellent. Try and live it. Difficult. And so we're really directly looking at the difficulties of living it. And we're also making it such that it is doable and that it doesn't remain in the realm of ideals. So the practical realities are paramount uh, as a value. Reflecting, learning about values will affect your attitudes and educators have identified the following requirements for successful learning. We're still on page 19 and the first aspect we come to is appropriate atmosphere. I must admit when I read this, I didn't realize that it actually played uh, such an important role. It would be nice to have it, but I didn't realize it was mandatory. And when I read this, I realized um, that, yeah, one cannot achieve what you want to without it. All of us are sensitive to the atmosphere, vibrations, and overall environment. If the atmosphere is chaotic and undisciplined, it is hard to learn. Of course, and if the teachers and the administration of an educational institution are demonstrating a set of values that is different from what's being taught, you can't learn. It has to be consistent, it has to be coherent, otherwise it doesn't have reality. And this is also something that you see in how children are raised. If their parents don't demonstrate and provide an environment that corresponds exactly to what they're saying, what they're doing, everything is coherent, uh, then only the children can learn. Because language is not just words. Everything is a message, including the atmosphere and vibrations. So if you have a very tense atmosphere, very punitive, moralistic uh, approach to things, then the people will be all the time in a state of self-defense and they're not going to learn um, values, they're going to learn how to survive in that hostile atmosphere. So we have to understand what we're doing here. The next aspect really caught my attention because there is so much of evidence to the contrary and because this is not the reality anywhere in the world. Um, I'm going to elaborate on what I mean. Competition, Sister Denise says on page 19, does not always function as a useful stimulus for better performance. Where there is competition and where some enjoy unfair advantages, the atmosphere becomes oppressive and dehumanizing. That is, um, that came as a surprise because often teachers would use competition uh, for pupils to do better. Well, it can work for people to do better, but it depends how it's used, how it's positioned. You see, um, if people are pressured, penalized, um, if it's an unequal playing field, then a person will feel, look, the odds are unfairly stacked against me, I'm not being uh, recognized, I'm not free, my learning style may be different from the one they like, and so I'm going to not learn. You know, and a lot of students just refuse to learn because they experience, and they may not be able to articulate it, but definitely um, on an intuitive level, they know that they cannot 
function in that environment. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is a lot of people are not able to articulate what is wrong with the environment, why they cannot function in it, and demand that it be changed because they're not in a position of power. Um, take the exam system. Um, the exam system is thought to indicate what a person's intelligence is, but actually the exam system indicates who's good at taking exams rather than who's intelligent. Uh, there are very few people on the planet who are able to draw that distinction. Well, there are quite a few nowadays because a lot of changes began to take place in the 1960s and 70s where this was raised, and that's already quite a long time ago. And then a few in, uh, educational establishments began to introduce continuous assessment because if you're not well on the exam day or you had a big trauma at home, and then you can't function well on the exam and then that goes into your record forever and that becomes what you are and there's no way that you can get around that because it's written in the record, you see. You end up this paragraph with the following words, whether you study value education as a distance education course or as a residential course, Careful attention is given to the atmosphere, discipline and surroundings to maximize the beneficial impact of the program. You want to elaborate on that? One of the most successful situations we had in the experiments we did to teach this is when we had a group of 24 college principals uh, come for six days to the Brahma Kumaris headquarters and live in the um, place which was totally surrounded by beautiful nature, meditation, vegetarian food, um, everybody living a value-based life and everything was absolutely conducive to deep discussion and all of the people were on the same level professionally. Some of them knew each other, some of them didn't, but the uh, social cohesion and bonding and depth of, uh, and breadth of conversation that took place in this group really pointed to the importance of atmosphere. And if you're trying to study something like this in a chaotic atmosphere, obviously it's going to pull your attention away, it's going to prevent um, this uh, creation of uh, a, a harmonized atmosphere which really is very conducive to understanding, to getting insights and so on. So. Um, really very important, but it's very rare that you learn in an ideal atmosphere. But I think it's possible to establish a better atmosphere once you understand the importance of it. You mentioned a number of aspects that should come into play as far as creating an appropriate atmosphere is concerned. Punctuality, mutual respect between teachers and students, good communication systems, cleanliness and order all contribute to establishing the right atmosphere for learning. Why are all of these factors important? Punctuality. If everybody's there at the right time, you can start. You have only a certain amount of time in which to have your um, learning experience. If you're having to wait for people to come in and out, if people are talking, there's not proper attention, there's disrespect, you can't begin. And um, there's interruptions, cell phones going off, all of these things. These are um, signs of carelessness, signs of disregard, signs that you really are not there for the program. And so it can't work. Uh, if you do not have mutual respect between the teachers and students, then it's a top-down situation, mm. and students will um, if, feel, you know, if you feel disrespected, you close down. 
Yeah, that is the reality of many child student and adult student. Definitely. You know, if you go in there as a teacher thinking that these people don't have any values, there's prejudice. And people will feel it. That will also make you close down. If your space is ordered, clean, um, nice, all of these, they're little things, but they make all the difference between you get it or you don't get it. You want to be there or you don't want to be there. So you have to um, bear in mind that in order for the learning process to work well, every single one of these elements makes a difference. And you'll see in some educational establishments for people who are very privileged, I have to say, they pay attention to that detail. And this is why the students do so well. Mm. It's a reality. Okay. I would now like to go to 1.3.2, entitled Inspiring Curriculum. You say, students are interested when course material is relevant, well presented, thought provoking and calculated for benefit. When both teachers and students are inspired by the curriculum, worthwhile and stimulating discussion takes place, assignments are completed with interest and enthusiasm and in a timely manner. That's. Um, that's an ideal environment, isn't it? It is, and it's attainable. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not an unattainable ideal. Uh, I think that um, one of the worst things to be is boring. Okay, I had not listed that as a sin, but um, why do you say that? You're referring to the teacher. The curriculum. Okay, and w okay. If the curriculum is boring, if it's irrelevant, if it doesn't stimulate the interest of the student, then there's something wrong with it. But usually what happens is people say, well, whether the curriculum's boring or not is neither here nor there. This is what you have to learn. And the student will say, not interested. <laughs> doesn't mean anything to me. Go mm. away. You see, so they, they're there by force. Mm. And you can't learn something if you're there by force. The teacher, you know, has to be an entertainer. The teacher has to make the subject come alive. Mm. And then the student can learn something. But if the curriculum is by itself already um, boring, irrelevant, not preparing the student for life and the student doesn't see the point, well, they'll be busy with something else. They may be there physically, but they're not there mentally. So this is very important. If we want the children, the young people, the adults to be productive and um, interested participants in the society and contribute, uh, that there has to be something in it for them. They have to get something out of it. And to be stimulated is a very great wealth mm. that they would um, be nurtured by. So an inspiring curriculum is very important. Who creates the curriculum as the educational ministry or whatever, mm. and why, you know. Um, we don't always have a really good educators preparing the curriculum. If it's administrators preparing the curriculum, they may not understand important aspects of education that they need to mm. know in order for this to work. The next line was rather thought-provoking. Each participant in the educational program takes inspiration from the next and there is a good cross-fertilization of ideas. This program is alive with a sense of commitment and everyone involved desires to invest time, energy and attention. Tell us what you mean by cross-fertilization of ideas. That's a lovely uh, term. You know, um, there are m different aspects of pedagogy and different styles of teaching and learning. And as I have mentioned already, this is a holistic type of learning environment. 
And when we are learning together and the participants are interacting with each other, you know, ideally everyone is sitting in a circle. It's not a teacher at the front and a lineup of people in front of the teacher absorbing what the teacher says and then regurgitating it in tests. No, each and every person's opinion is sought. Each and every one has to share their experiences, what their um, problems are, what their challenges are, what their understanding is, and they uh, do a lot of talking with each other in groups which means that the education environment is very alive. In an education environment, if the students are passive, the brain doesn't work so well. Once they're uh, active and talking and listening, uh, uh, they start firing on all the cylinders and things work much better. Hmm. Okay, so the um, interaction between the students is as important as their interaction between the teacher and the students. Yeah, and in certain situations, the teacher just becomes one of them. Of course, the teacher is guiding, facilitating, and so on, but the teacher can easily move away from being didactic hmm. and just say, okay, let us consider these questions and then let it move. Because there's a great deal contained within the participants. And especially if it's an adult group of people, you don't want to have a top-down situation because this is not about absorbing information. Uh, tell us what you mean by a top-down situation because we haven't got there yet to that part of the book. Where the teacher knows everything, the teacher is the authority and the students are supposed to be absorbing information and giving it back and if they give it back wrong then they are wrong. That's a top-down situation. Okay, so uh, does the teacher in this scenario ever have the right to say to a student, the adult student, you're wrong? If the teacher says to someone you're wrong, it has to be because they're illogical, um, but not because their opinion is different from the opinion of the teacher. Because in matters of value, you cannot say that one set of values takes over from another set of values, making the other set of values wrong. And, and what we have is um, different criteria. And um, in order for a person to say, okay, I hold this particular set of values for these and these and these reasons, if that person has a set of values which infringes someone's freedom, then the teacher needs to draw their attention to that and ask them, you know, if you're doing this, you know, you're, you're going to be uh, getting yourself into a conflict with the law, something like this. Mm. So then the teacher will say, this is a problem that you're going to encounter, but just saying somebody they're wrong closes them down, you, you see, so we can't and there's no point in doing it like that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you so much for spending your half an hour with us. I do hope that this has taken your education one step further. I will see you again for the next episode. Take care and goodbye. Mm -hmm.